Thank you for finding us again. No stop lots. Want to thank our sponsors as we always do: Pepsi of Florence, Carolina Bank, Mickey Finn's Marlboro PD Electric Co-op, Francis Marion University, McLeod Health, McCall Farms, Victor's PLC um, Commercial. And, and I mean this sincerely. I, I'm being redundant. Uh, my mom said, say thank you more times than you think you need to say thank you. And, and I do want to thank our sponsors. We're building something here. We're obviously not where we need to be, but um, better days lie ahead. None of this would be possible uh, w- without our sponsors. I try to consider our sponsors. I honestly do. When I began scouring the countryside for content, I start thinking about the reflection that my opinions have on our sponsors um, we talked a lot about this in some of the radio format. Um, I'll use Limbaugh as an example. Rush Limbaugh was undeniably a radio behemoth, a media behemoth, but some sponsors felt less compelled to be a part of his product, despite the large audiences. Um, it was a little bit oxymoronic. As, as an advertiser, advertiser and a manufacturer of widgets, I need to try to market my widgets in front of the largest audiences. But some of the audiences get a bit controversial. We understand that the world of political podcasting, radio broadcasting, conservative news, I mean, it's controversial. It's very blunt. It's very abrupt. It's not diplomatic at times. Um, But I think it's very necessary in the debate of ideas in the direction of our country and and what we believe and what you believe um, are certainly two different things. The one thing that I've consistently said over the years, I don't have any interest in trying to convince you to believe exactly what I believe, but but rather formulate some sort of sincere and honest debate we can have about whatever issue that may be coming down the pipe politically, culturally, societally. We talk a lot of sports uh, on some of these podcasts. We do one with the Garnet Trust. My loyalty to the Gamecocks knows no bounds. Uh, it's kind of a it's a glutton for punishment instead of a uh, a fandom. But but I'm unapologetic in what I believe, what I stand for, and uh, and where I stand. One of the one of the issues I want to talk about today is it's kind of a macro and a micro. We've seen these Venn diagrams, circle here, circle there, Venn diagram, overlap. How much overlap is with uh, this micro and this macro? Um, There's some of that in this subject I'm discussing uh, because it's timely. It is very sensitive and it's very important to American politics. Um, And then there's this flow chart that I'll get to in just a second. So this is a bit, uh, I hesitate to say, tutorial in nature. But we are discussing a macro and a micro and the Venn diagram, the overlap of one and the other. And we'll also kind of, um, this leads to this. And then that leads to something else. It's um, That's kind of the flow chart part of this, um, this podcast. But as we speak... There's a great debate in the United States Congress about foreign aid, um, aid to Ukraine and Israel in particular, and border security. The art of American politics has largely required certain compromises. You've got a conservative universe. You've got a liberal universe. You've got Republicans who, by and large, ascribe to the the notions of conservatism. You've got a a Democrat party that largely ascribes to the theories of of liberalism. Um, Once again, I don't care what you are. That's your prerogative. And I would imagine at times we find ourselves personally conflicted in what we believe. I, I like to say... I'm a socialist libertarian. I don't care much for your government, but I love my government, the one that aids and assists what I think government should do. But but right now in the U.S. Congress, there's a very passionate debate being held about packaging, uh, you know, compromising on foreign aid to Ukraine and border security. I I want to play into that for a second and get to what I call the kind of the flow chart part of this debate. Um, I mean, I've served in elected office. I've learned through the years that political speech is just that. I mean, it's spin meisters galore. I mean, they they are everywhere. Um, You got some that spin it to the conservative side, some that spin it to the to the liberal side. But but the reality is, the one thing that I've always found is, and in, as in most of our lives, where is the money? I mean, it, you, you, he said this, she said that. They disagree here, but they agree here. Fair enough. Some of that's political theater. Some of it is the pomp and circumstance of American politics. But I've always deferred to the numbers. Where 
where is the money going if we're voting on an appropriation of some sort? If it's foreign aid, if it's um, if it's you know securing the border, immigration policy, what the priorities lie where the money's being spent. Forget what they say on Fox. Forget what they say on CNN. Forget what they um, say on CNBC. That's myself included. I mean, I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Um, I spend my money on things that are important to me. Congress is no different. They're going to appropriate and allocate money, your taxpayer dollars, on things that they perceive to be in the country's best interest or at times their best interest. There's kind of a, um, once again, the conflict of what is best for the nation, but but what, what what is kind of best for me as I go back home and explain to my constituents. I took exception with $118 billion, with a B, uh, with $118 billion border security package. There was a lot of language. There was a lot of marketing, a lot of branding, a lot of he said, she said about where uh, where the priorities lie. I went through about through, uh, 70 or 80 pages, not this. I mean, I'm not reading the bill now, but as I look through the bill, and it's called a border security bill. That leads you to believe what? That border security is a priority, right? I mean, if it's a border security bill and the U.S. Senate is trying to convince the American public that our priority in this negotiation has been to secure our southern border. It's unacceptable what's happening down there. Well, I started, okay, I hear what they say, but that doesn't mean jack um, because they're politicians and hardly ever do they say what they really mean, uh, present company included. So I look through and I find the appropriation page. I find where the money's actually being appropriated. Who's getting what? Uh, because once again, money's the answer. Now, what's the question? And, and as I look through the border security bill, it dawned on me that about $20 billion of the $118 billion was spent on border security. That's odd. I mean, that's 18% of all appropriated dollars spent on the namesake of the bill. $60 billion was going to be spent in Ukraine. $15 billion is going to be spent in Israel. Um, $10 billion in Indochina security or conflict. Well, I mean, that's Taiwan, China is what that is. That's America engaging, involving itself in the, the Taiwanese-Chinese debate about national sovereignty or is there going to be some sort of military conflict there? And then there was another about $10 billion in uh, humanitarian aid to, I want to make sure I get this right, Gaza, the West Bank, and, and Ukraine. Fair enough. Um, fair enough. I mean, that, that, that's where the money was going to be appropriated. I went back and looked at the title, uh, border security bill. 18% of the money spent on border security. That That's kind of the, that's the micro within the macro. They began a debate about ba basically creating standalone bills. Um, if we can't get this through the Senate and the House, can we get a spending bill? Can we get a foreign aid bill? Can we get a border security bill? I would imagine that's the best way to do it. I believe that's in the best interest of the American people. I mean, I understand packaging. I understand compromise. I understand we don't live in a dictatorship. We don't answer to a monarch or a king. Uh, when men govern fellow man, there's got to be some negotiation involved in that. But, but misleading the public in my humble opinion, not so humble opinion, is inexcusable, and that's what I think the bill did. I think it was egregious to lead the American people into believing that the United States Senate set as its priority border security when only $20 billion of the $118 billion was spent on actual border security. The lion's share of the funding was a foreign policy hodgepodge. I'm not saying we don't need to do something in Ukraine. I'm not suggesting we turn a blind eye to Israel. I'm not saying humanitarian aid and assistance is not needed in the Gaza, the West Bank, and, um, and, and Ukraine. I'm just saying, why don't we shoot the American people straight? And, and that's where the micro ends and the macro begins. I'll defer or refer to the, to the flow chart I've kind of created here. And I mean, I, a flow chart would be very kind to the scribbling that I put on this paper. So in, in normal times, historically, when, when legislatures, when, when, a, when, a, when a Congress says to the American people, we're deeply concerned about our border. We're deeply concerned about global security. We are America. We are uh, in the American century. Maybe we're at the dusk of the American century. We'll do a podcast about that. I read a book not long ago, actually an essay, um, 
the American century dusk and the Chinese century dawn. I mean, that's kind of an intellectual debate to have uh, for another day. But, but in the macro, historically, when, when Congress goes on, when, when, when the Republicans go on Fox and the Democrats go on uh, every other network, um, and they express their belief about why this is important and how the Republicans and Democrats have put their partisan differences aside and they're doing what's in the genuine best interest of the American people. Historically, we have bought that. Now, now I believe somewhere back here in the in the in the the right rear quadrant of our brains, we're like, I don't know, man, something doesn't smell right there. But conventional wisdom, for the most part, carried the day, and the American people, blindly or not, kind of got in line, and we kind of said, okay, I mean, these are our duly elected representatives. Surely they're not going to terribly mislead us. I mean, yeah, I mean, they'll take some liberties with the truth, but they're not going to just in 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 the in the in the most obvious way imagine mislead the American people. And the bill would pass, and we would have eighteen percent of a $120 billion border security bill spent on actual border security. Now, after the fact, the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, the late Rush Limbaugh's of the world, um, some of these investigative journalists, if there are any left, I mean, they, they would read through the legislation and they say, hey, guys, did you know that only 18% of the $120 billion was actually spent on border security? And somebody in Congress, some consultant, some lobbyist, some power broker would say, yeah, I mean, you know, put that away, put that away. I mean, let, let's not talk about that now. That leads me to the macro. I, I mentioned conventional wisdom a second ago. So for conventional wisdom to hold, in other words, for the United States Congress to go in a room somewhere and party leadership, Republican and Democrat, hash out a, a package deal. The Republicans are going to get what they want, some degree of border security. The Democrats will get what they want. This is the weirdest thing of it all. The Democrats are the hawks. I mean, the Democrats are twisting arms of former hawkish Republicans turned doves uh, about foreign affairs and global security and uh, the exportation of the American empire, uh, the military industrial con I mean we we once again that's a, a podcast for another day. I want to go back to the macro. So so conventionally we have done that. The American people have with with some degree of skepticism, we've accepted that the Democrats and the Republicans got together they decided this is best for the country. We're going to spend money on border security, but there's no way we can't get a deal on border security unless we support some of the um Ah, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. I mean, let's call it what it is. I'm not a Putin sympathizer, but but I believe Ukraine is, anyway, uh, it's a meat grinder. I can say that. It's a meat grinder. Ukraine will eventually run out of young men to fight. I mean, that, that's the, the horrible tragedy in all of this. 60 billion, 80 billion, 100 billion, peace deal, no peace deal, Donbass region, warm water ports, Putin is a dictator. Uh, okay, all of those are fair points, and I would imagine that we can address and discuss those individually. But, but the macro of all macros in that particular situation, as I understand it, I'm not a military uh, expert, but I'm not employed by the military industrial complex. Uh, be very skeptical of the military experts that you see. Um, masquerading themselves as military experts, that they're basically minions for the military industrial complex. Ukraine will run out of young men sooner or later. I think the average age of a Ukrainian soldier 18 months ago was 28. Don't hold me to that. Today it's 41 or two. I mean, it's a meat grinder. It's horrible. It's horrific. Doesn't make me a Putin sympathizer. It makes me a realist. It's not about being negative or being positive. It's being it's being real. And the reality is the quicker Ukraine can figure out a way to negotiate a peace treaty, some sort of negotiated peace deal with NATO, the Western world, and Russia, the less likely it is that every Ukrainian male dies in this very tragic war. Not defending Putin, not defending Russia. Uh, they invaded a sovereign nation. That there's a fair debate to be had about post-Soviet Union, Russia, NATO, and Western uh, Western advancement toward Eastern Europe. Uh, once again, we got a lot of content for future podcasts. Let's go back to the macro. I want to conclude with this. So, conventional wisdom says that Congress, 
whether in the Senate or House, pass a compromising piece of legislation. It goes to the other body. In this case, it'll be from the Senate to the House. They'll bang the gavel. They'll shake hands. They'll take pictures. They'll celebrate with the media. President has about 300 pens. He signs it and gives a pen and signs it and gives a pen. And, you know, the world is a better place because Congress acted. Conventionally, that's what's happened. Where are we today? I don't know exactly, but I have an opinion that conventional wisdom depends upon trustworthy leadership. And when leadership becomes less trustworthy, it's harder for conventional wisdom to hold. And, and I think we're at, I don't want to say the beginning, but I'm not sure where we are. Let's use a baseball diamond as an example. I mean, I ask people, hey, we're building a house. We're buying a piece of property. Where are we in the process? We're at second base. We're halfway there. Um, where are we now? We're halfway between second and third. So when it comes to conventional wisdom, depends upon trustworthy leadership. The trustworthy leadership has to maintain the moral authority to pass legislation that the public have faith and trust in. And we're watching that destroyed right before our very eyes. We talk about this very chaotic and disruptive uh, political time we're living in. And people say, what do you attribute that to? Well, what's the cause of that? I mean, Trump is a manifestation of that, no doubt. Trump is a, a consequential political figure, not because he's some student of an ideology. I mean, he's not. I mean, I doubt he's ever read Atlas Shrugged. I doubt he's a subscriber to the National Review. Um, I guess he reads the Wall Street Journal. I don't know. Um, probably reads the New York Times, having been uh, spent most of his life in New York. But, but Trump is the manifestation of, once again, the conventional wisdom holding based on a trustworthy leadership class, when the ruling class loses the faith and trust of the American people, their ability to govern, that moral authority that is required to govern becomes less and less and less. And the reason we've seen such an acceleration of a decline in the moral authority required for government leaders to make decisions in the country's best interest is there's no ability now to control the narrative. I mean, I'm podcasting. I don't work for CBS News. I don't work for NBC or ABC. In the good old days, in the good old days, the leadership of the Senate, leadership of the House would get together with a gaggle of reporters, probably off the record, in a room that you and I will never be invited to, and they'll tell the skinny. They'll say, hey, here's what we're doing, and here's how we need the story to be told. And, I mean, I'm not saying every journalist is in the tank. And I will say every journalist, by and large, depends on a salary paid by the network that requires advertising. I mean, you know, if, if you want to get right down to it, why would meet the press throw a Boeing under the bus about some of the problems with this this um this Max airplane they're built and having a lot of issues? Why would they have a scathing report on a Sunday morning show about Boeing when Meet the Press is brought to you by Boeing? Why would NBC, ABC, CBS question the efficacy of a vaccine, the safety of a vaccine, when half the network is brought to you by Pfizer? So it has run into somewhat, it's kind of interesting, we're talking about state-run media, and in America, there's kind of a quasi, uh, not across the board, and I'm not trying to say, you know, everybody does this and everybody does that, but, but podcasting and Twitter and Facebook and social media and the internet in general have allowed people who have alternate and, I mean, the media would say an extreme opinion. And let's say I've got an opinion that we've not been told the whole story about the 2020 presidential election. I mean, that's my opinion. I, I've researched it. I've studied it. Uh, I've looked at some of the statistical anomalies. I look at the number of people who um, voted unsupervised mail-in ballots. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but I've got these questions. And CBS and ABC and NBC make my opinion seem ah, extreme. And nobody wants an extreme opinion. Nobody wants to be considered an extremist. Climate change would be another. I have a lot of questions about climate change. I mean, I think the climate's changing. It's warmer today than it was yesterday. Uh, it rained yesterday. It didn't rain today. Uh, and I know we're talking about climate and weather being two separate things. But, but all of a sudden, there's been a disruption of controlling the narrative. And, and I believe that the decentralized media is a large contributor to why the U.S. Senate 
can't get a bill to the House that the House will bite on. Is it good for America? Is it bad for America? I don't know. I mean, I'll let us decide in the long run. We've had ebbs and flows. We've had good times and bad times. We've had, you know, conservative government. We've had liberal government. We've had moderate government. We've had good presidents. We've had we've had bad presidents. But we are in a very chaotic and disruptive political period right now as we speak. And when I look at the issue of immigration, excuse me, a border security and I look at, and I don't like people that confuse immigration with what's happening at the southern border. Um, ashamed is what we should be of what's happening at the southern border. As proud as we should be about what the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island represent, we should be as pissed off as you can imagine about what we've allowed to happen at our southern border. God bless the people on those border states. Um, that's my immigration rant for a second, illegal immigration rant for a second. But but back to the flow chart, and I'll conclude with this. Here's where we are from my perspective. Trump is a manifestation of the, the lack of trust people have in what they've historically believed, the conventional wisdom. Uh, maybe I suspected that something didn't smell quite right, but the media was so controlled by, by these powerful forces and these, these kind of allied forces and once again, a room that you and I will never be invited in, the leadership of the Senate, leadership of the House, sit down with members of the meeting and explain the bill, what the priorities are, what, what, the, what, what the sensibilities were, but more than that, what they want the narrative to be. And once you can't control the narrative, there are millions of people around America who have serious questions, and I'll use this bill as an example. I don't know how many of you know that in the 118 billion dollar border security bill only 20 billion was spent on border security i don't know how many of you know that um 60 billion was going to be spent in ukraine once again so it's a foreign policy bill with a little bit of the money spent on on border security in historic eras pre-trump that would have been okay um, most Americans would never have found out about that. And someone asked me yesterday, I mean, I spent some time in government presiding over the South Carolina State Senate. Someone asked me yesterday, um, why is the Senate so different than the House? And here's the best answer I can give you. And this is the beauty of the will of the people, why you matter as a voter. The House runs every two years. If the House makes a call contrary to the will of the people, they don't get off the hook. They don't get, uh, it's a little bit like the, the husband and wife go to bed angry and you hope you wake up the next morning not as angry with one another. The House doesn't have that luxury. I mean, these guys are perpetually, and ladies are perpetually running for office. They're always in front of the constituency. They have no choice. They're in campaign mode every single moment of every single day uh, as they try to make legislation that benefits and betters the American way of life. But, but they have to be so much more in touch with the general public because they're running every two years. The Senate can, and I know the founders intended this. I mean, the Senate is kind of the, um, uh, it's the cerebral part. It's the high-minded, high-browed uh, part of our government. But the one advantage the Senate has in passing legislation that may not be reflective of public sentiment is they've got a long time to ask you for your forgiveness. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and and I, I don't know that that's a great illustration. Uh, I would imagine that there are a lot of you listening to my voice that want to do something for Ukraine, wish to do something for Israel, wish the border were secure. I mean, I'm a hard no on money to Ukraine. And the reason I'm a hard money to Ukraine or a hard no to money with Ukraine is not because I have a burning desire for Putin to take over Eastern Europe and then march across Poland into Western. I don't have any interest in that. I'm not sure I buy into that. He's the next Hitler. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. Um, my problem is there's no clear path forward for Ukraine. Uh, we were told 18 months ago or so that if we funded this Ukrainian supplement bill, they could defeat Putin. Remember all the visuals? So this goes back to controlling the narrative. Remember how many networks are on board? They're destroying Russian tanks at a record pace. They're killing Russian shoulders, soldiers at a record pace. And the Ukrainian soldiers are to be commended for their valor and courage. I mean, there, there is no doubt about that. Some of the most courageous um, people on this planet have been 
the men and women in Ukraine fighting for their freedom, fighting uh, for their sovereignty. But we were told 18 months ago, Putin was at the precipice of being defeated. I heard yesterday in one of the, um, well, I don't want one of the supportive commentaries by a member of the U.S. Senate that if Ukraine gets this 80 billion, 60 billion, it's 85 billion dollar standalone bill, but I think 15 billion goes, it might be 95, 95 billion. It's, it, it takes out the, um, the border security part. So it's pretty much all of the 118 billion spent on, on foreign policy or foreign aid, um, but, but I heard somebody say yesterday that if Ukraine gets this $60 billion, they will be able by late summer to negotiate a very advantageous peace treaty. So we, in 18 months, went from they've got to have this money to defeat the Russians to if we don't give them this money, they won't be able to negotiate an advantageous peace treaty. Once again, conventional wisdom, trustworthy leadership, Moral authority, control the narrative, decentralized media. And because of all those complexities, the foreign aid bill is probably DOA in the House, dead on arrival. Why? Because most Americans, conservative or liberal, the polls say, are more interested and want to treat as a priority the securing of our border before we spend another damn dime in Ukraine. <laughs>